everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Carol Endeavor, and I'm the Dean of the College of Arts and Science. Um, I was thinking this morning that along with the autumn leaves and the freshman chemistry midterms and the World Series, the annual Harry Howard lecture is a fixture, fixture of our life on this beautiful campus every October. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the 2009 Harry C. Howard Jr. Lecture. Um, a reminder to all of us to silence our cell phones. Um, this is the 15th an anniversary of this distinguished event, which has featured a remarkable array of visiting speakers and also famously lively dinners afterward. Um, this lectureship was generously endowed by Mr. and Mrs. Thomas E. Nash, Jr. and Mr. and Mrs. George D. Renfro, all of Asheville, North Carolina, to honor their friend and attorney, Harry C. Howard, Jr. Surely it's a rare tribute for clients to reach out to honor their attorney. Sorry, bad lawyer joke. That was probably a bad form. And the Vanderbilt community benefits from this love and generosity. Mr. Howard is a member of the Vanderbilt class of 1951 and completed his legal training at the Emory University Law School. He practiced law with King and Spalding from 1956 to 1992. Mr. Howard has continued to support the annual Howard Lecture since its initial endowment. And I'm so pleased to welcome Mr. Howard and his wife, Taddy, back this year. And where are you? Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you so much for coming. As always, I want to thank Mona Frederick, Professor Ed Friedman, and the staff of the Robert Penn Warren Center for the Humanities for organizing this wonderful event. And let me extend to you the warmest of welcomes and invite Professor Friedman to introduce today's distinguished speaker. Ed. The Robert Penn Warren Center for the Humanities in Vanderbilt University are happy to welcome you to the 15th annual Harry C. Howard Jr. Lecture. We are extremely pleased and honored that Mr. and Mrs. Howard are with us today, and we thank them for their generosity and for sponsoring a program that, over the years, has brought a truly impressive group of distinguished speakers to the university and to the Nashville community. My name is Edward Friedman. I teach Spanish and comparative literature at Vanderbilt, I'm currently serving as faculty director of the Warren Center. One of the nicest perks of many of my job is the privilege of introducing the Harry C. Howard lecturer. Rosanna Warren is a highly esteemed and highly decorated poet, scholar, translator, and teacher. She is the Emma Ann uh, McLaughlin Metcalf Professor of the Humanities at Boston University. She is a graduate of Yale University and holds an MA from the writing seminars of Johns Hopkins University. Her publications include the poetry collections, Snow Day, Each Leaf Shines Separate, Stained Glass, and Departure, as well as a recent book of literary criticism, Fables of the Self, Studies in Lyric Poetry, and a translation in collaboration with Stephen Scully of Euripides' The Suppliant Women. Among her long list of awards figure the Pushcart Prize the Award of Merit in Poetry and the Witter Binner Prize from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, the May Sarton Prize, the Ingram Merrill Foundation Award, the Lila Wallace Reader's Digest Award, the Ellen Maria Garrison Prize of the American Academy in Berlin, Boston University's Metcalf Award for Excellence in Teaching, and fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the American Council of Learned Societies, and the Coleman Center of the New York Public Library. Rosanna Warren served as a chancellor of the American Academy, uh, of the Academy of American Poets from 1999 to 2005. She was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Letters in 2005. I'm certainly not here to analyze Rosanna Warren's poetry, but as a student of literature, I am fascinated by the breadth, sophistication, and to use a fashionable, for now term, hybridity of her work. There are continual surprises in the poetry. One does not know what to expect in terms of the blend of imagery and message, erudition and emotional impact, control and boldness. The poet Anthony Hecht writes eloquently of her poems. Rosanna Warren lives in our tarnished, everyday ramshackle world of loss, anguish, and sacrifice, but she inhabits almost as vividly a realm of classical purity and in some of her best, most moving poems, she dwells in both regions at once, and within, as it seems, the same breadth. It is a beautiful miracle of bilocation. 
The poet herself, in an interview in the Kenyan Review, states, for me, there's no interesting art that doesn't have a potent formal sense and also a powerful disruptive sense. I look for that in art. I look for some ratio of resistance between powerful form and powerful disruption. The poem from New Hampshire in Stained Glass contains the verse, you're a connoisseur of boundaries. And I think that her poetry shows that Rosanna Warren is exactly that, an explorer and remaker of boundaries, a scholar and an artist, with a voice simultaneously all her own and subject to change. We cannot welcome Rosanna Warren to Vanderbilt without acknowledging that she is the daughter of the novelist Eleanor Clark, a recipient of the National Book Award, and the acclaimed poet, novelist, critic, and Vanderbilt alumnus Robert Penn Warren, whose name our center bears. Those genes obviously have served her well. She is from a remarkable family, and she is remarkable. We are delighted that she has accepted our invitation to deliver the 15th Harry C. Howard Jr. Lecture. Her title is Poems and Poem Talk, a poetry reading and informal chat with Rosanna Warren. Professor Warren. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you enormously. I'm going to turn on this alarming machine and see if it doesn't blow me up in front of you. There, am I, am I audible? Good. I propose, first of all, I want to thank Vanderbilt, thank the Warren Center, uh, thank Mona Frederick, thank you all. Uh, this is, you may imagine, intensely moving for me to be back here in my father's school and in a school where I had a very happy year teaching in my early life. Um, and it's, it's not an academic occasion for me. It, in complex ways, a very personal occasion. Uh, so I thank you for inviting me. What I'd like to do is to read the poems from the manuscript of, of poetry that I've just finished and that I'm happy to say Norton has just accepted, so I feel relieved about that, uh, and talk a little bit about building this manuscript. Uh, and it will include a sequence of prose, small prose poems from the Odyssey that accompany some monotypes by the painter James McGarrell. So at a certain point, I will start showing you pictures, but I won't start with the pictures. Uh, here's a challenge for you. Um, I am still uncertain about the title for this book. I'll tell you now two of the titles I have in mind, and after you've heard some of the poems uh, it, during a question and period afterwards, you, you may tell me that both are terrible or that you prefer one <laughs> over the other, and that would be interesting for me to hear. Um, this book is more overtly political than my recent lyric work. Um, and uh, I try in it, as you'll see, because I've chosen representative poems from different sections of the book, to blend a sense of more public pol and political uh, poetry, at least the themes and settings are public and political, with poems of intimacy, um, and I hope that you'll find there are some tissues of connection between them. This poem is called Porta Portese, which is the flea market in Rome. It's interesting to me now to observe that I wrote it in August 2008, just before the collapse in the world financial markets. And the poem is already stimulated by a kind of what I would call financial rage. Uh, well, you, may, you may hear that in it. Um, I tell my Italian friends, just so they don't get offended about the picture of Rome, I said it's, it's called Porta Portese, but it's really about Wall Street. <laughs> Porta Portese. If it once gleamed, if it ticked, if it buzzed, if it oiled eternal youth, if it whispered on an old tape with the sexual lure of infinite cash, if it said, I am your private castle and you are a queen, if it lit a thousand bulbs, if it shaved a thousand hairs, if it declared God loves you, if it promised to cure hair lip, eczema, scabies, rage, if it clipped hangnails, 
if it delivered proverbs, if it hugged the ass it's laid out on a collapsible table or mat on asphalt. Money will change hands. Money will change us all. Change gypsies, professors, Nigerian whores, limping children, drugged babies, eye-potted teens, Somali refugees, artists in drag, illegal Albanians, cruising poles. We said one world. We said, isn't my money good enough for you? Switch blades, switch banks. The cloaca maxima accepts all currencies. The Tiber leaks yellow between its legs, venereal, venerable, duty-free, luxurious, silken, rippling, classical waves, sold and soldered, solved, reflected here. Well, the whole book isn't in that tone. <laughs> and one of the things that interests me in building a book, and you can see here that this is my loose, my loose notebook where the poems accumulated over, in this case, about six years, grow, and then I change the order and I fool around with it. I have an order now, uh, which is not the order in which I'm reading, but the order of the book. But um, one of the, one of the. Th uh, challenges of putting together the book is tonal, is trying to make a range of tone and to think about transitions in tone as well as in theme. And I think tone is almost more important to me than, than theme. So when I started with a rather, to me, vulgar remark that some of these poems are political and external and some are intimate and internal, that's only broadly the case, I hope. Fire. Uh, in, this, in this poem, there is a reference to a street in Baghdad, Mutanabi Street, which is the famous street of booksellers and has been for many, many years. Fire. It would take a voodoo skull, one eye darkened, one candle lit, to see into these pictures. Who set that fire? Who piled that cliff of smoke? The newsprint is jaundiced, ripped at the edge. I set that fire. I piled that bombastic mountaining smoke. I mound it up every night, and I don't haul anyone out. The bodies are stiff, like little T-squares. It's not clear what geometry problem they solve. The ditch is a rampart. The live ones, turbaned, stand on the upper rim. Bombed trucks burn rectangularly. The books on Mutanabi Street make a chunky oatmeal mush. This world, the same for all, was shaped by no god or man, but always was and will be an everlasting fire, said Heraclitus. And the child, in the charred room, reaches out to touch the wall. The furniture's burned, his father's shot. The mirror reflects only the camera flash. We found fire in our souls before we stole it from heaven. Now we are the lords of light, and the dark room is ours. Um, some of these poems rise quite immediately from a, a lived experience of my own. Uh, and in my, in my satchel that I carry around with me, pretending to be a lady, uh, there are a number of notebooks, <laughs> which is why it's a satchel. There's a little drawing pad which is only for my own personal sketches to orient myself. And there's another little notebook of poems that I've memorized and written out by hand and keep with me always my private anthology of my gods. And there's another notebook in which I write journalistic notations of what training myself always to try to see more clearly and to put into words as, as opposed to into a sketch. Um, this, this poem I'm about to read called After is one that grew 
from some journalistic notations uh, in, um, in New Orleans uh, a few months after Katrina, when I was down there helping my daughter rebuild some houses. I must say I wasn't a great help. I'm not a great carpenter. And I wasn't there for very long, but she was there for six months, and I went down to try to pitch in a little. I hope a poem is more than a piece of journalism. So you'll see. After. The highway straight to the end of the world skims past a ruined mall, Kmart with roof stove in, Acres of parking lots where weeds judder through cracks. Police station smashed, but McDonald's still sells shocked grease. In the concrete barracks nursing home, all the old ones drowned, trapped in metal beds. A pink flounced girl floated for a week in sludge, legs apart, face down. Write an inventory, make an index, stutter a psalm. Raw sewage piped from cha trailers chokes the bayou. And I am thinking how to say and, or whether and is the word for the way beyond the swamp, the ghosts of pines and skeletal cypresses march for miles in haze. And how I lost count of slab after cement slab where bungalows used to stand under the bridge in a swarm of water hyacinths, alligators doze. Draw a map of where X's brother hanged himself, where Y died of diabetes when the drugs ran out, and an invisible map of smoke patterns in the lungs of the girl who hammers sheetrock and gessos cracks. Yesterday's eggs and oatmeal congeal on stacked plates. The house rises from moldy rubble and waist-high weeds. At night in the French Quarter, at the corner of Bourbon and Bienville, two boys gargle love songs in the red light tide, sluicing from barroom windows into the street. And as wind stoops to seize hard kisses from the current, the tunes ride guitar riffs in updrafts over the roofs across the delirium tremens river toward the gulf where small waves lip the horizon and sky stays mute. Um, some of my poems have very little in the way of autobiographical content, but they might seem like autobiography. And it's curious to, to, have, to, to have to say this, but even um, uh, sophisticated readers of poetry can fall into the trap of thinking that an imaginative work is, is this, oh, okay, <laughs> okay, okay, <laughs> that an imaginative work is somehow autobiography. The poem above I'm about to read to you may strike you as fairly self-destructive, and um, a, a literary critic writing about it wrote about it as if I had done all these things, and I afterwards said, what the hell, you, you know, if I, if, this is a poem. This is a work of imagination. And he thought about it. He said, yeah, after, if you'd done all these things, you'd probably be dead. <laughs> <laughs> Ocular. So damp, the pages of novels curl up like vine leaves. The stories smear. In the metro this morning, a man was scraping a poster from the wall. All the promised felicity hung in shreds. My eye is swollen, purple. I can't read, near or far. My childhood is far. I slept on a naked mattress the pit bull ripped. It reeked of smoke. Needles littered the floor. I starved myself. I admired my delicate ribs, the leaves of a petrified prehistoric Fern. I was prehistoric. My eye teeth turned to fangs. Day marched in, carrying night on his shoulders, a wizened old man. I preferred night. Come to me, I said. 
I'll kiss you anyway, even if you're ancient and I'm blind and bruised. We'll laugh. We'll be the book of revelation. I'll wear lingerie from the crypt and we'll eat at the loveless cafe where biscuits steam and no one spits in the jam. That was years ago. Night's tired now. We've worn each other out. We hardly meet. But I still have one good eye. And when I squint, you wouldn't believe what I see. Um, oh, I forgot to tell you the two possible titles for this book. One, one is the, the, the title of the poem I'm about to read, Mistral, or Mistral, the, the French wind, a violent wind that blows down from the north uh, across France and smashes its way into the Mediterranean and clatters the shutters and drives sailboats into the rocks and makes people kind of crazy. Um, this is, I, I have three poems under the title Mistral, and um, I thought of calling the book Mistral, but I thought better of it because it sounds pretentious and froggy. <laughs> but maybe you'll persuade me that it's the right title after all. Um, I spent part of my childhood in, in France. And this is a poem about going back to childhood. Mistral, one. Two donkeys graze in a meadow of wild golden buttons. Scents of eucalyptus and honeysuckle mingle in morning air. Distantly, down at the shore, rise the voices of children discovering things. Childhood burned with a long wick. I have returned here to examine the ashes. The gulls lament some tedious age-old woe as they skim off toward the harbor, while the sun bores into and into the petaled whorls of the golden flowers like radiation. The whole meadow bristling with a heat that destroys and sustains. This doesn't matter to the donkeys who munch on regardless. Over my garden table, the sun casts a shadow lattice of ilex leaves, an open weave that trembles across books and notebook pages, rearranging the words just as well. They were not the best words. I am willing to be rewritten and let the printed poems of others be rewritten as well and let them steep in the bitter smell of eucalyptus, which is said to heal. And may the dark fire far away, charring my friend's hurt cells, complete its work. Let him grow into his longer story, the good one the one in which sunlight runs in the veins with the force of summer, and children find some new thing and shout at the sea. Another poem in, the, in this Mistral sequence is, um, I also call Mediterranean. Um, and it is also, as you'll see, a poem splicing childhood and adulthood. When she disappeared on the path ahead of me, I leaned against a twisted oak. All I saw was evening light where she had been, gold dust light where a moment before and 38 years before that, my substantial mother strode before me in straw hat, bathing suit, and loose flapping shirt. Every summer afternoon, her knapsack, light across her back, her step in sandals firm on the stony path as we returned from the beach. And I mulled small rebellions and observed the dwarfish cork trees with their pocky bark, the wind wrestled oaks with arms akimbo, while shafts of sea light stabbed down between the trunks. There was something I wanted to say at the age of 12, some question she hadn't answered. And yesterday, so clearly, seeing her pace before me, it rose again to the tip of my tongue. And the mystery was not that she walked there 10 years after her death, 
but that she vanished and let twilight take her place. Um, there's another sequence in, in this, this book, which elegies um, for a dear friend of mine, the poet and nonfiction writer, Deborah Tall. I think I'll read you just one of those um, and one other lyric, and then I'll turn to the Odyssey, little, the little, um, I call them my vitamin pill Odyssey, and wrap things up <clears throat> and invite conversation if you feel like it. <clears throat> this is one of the poems for Deborah Tall, and it has an epigraph from one of her poems. Aftermath, dawn, the moment it was, it was over. Deborah Tall. It was that last euphoric summer between one chemo and another when you looked out your kitchen window and saw the doe standing at the edge of your lawn where the thicket gathers, autumn olive, buckthorn, forsythia, dogwood. And when you stepped outside, the doe stayed still and looked in your eyes, you thought, with a companionable, complicit question and didn't run. You were lightheaded. The doe lowered her nose to shove at the small bundle at her feet, folded up like an awkward deck chair, till then invisible in its hollow of grass. She had just given birth. The fawn couldn't stand, but raised its too large head to gaze at you. You were, as you said, already more or less posthumous. You took each other in. One of you before, the other beyond fear. Two creatures, side effects on one another, headed in opposite directions. Um, the other, the, the title I have now for the book um, is Ghost in a Red Hat, and it comes from this poem. And I'm not sure if it's a good title or not. We'll see. Ghost in a Red Hat. These cabbages under full sail, these ancient walls smothered in ivy and wisteria with its purple froth. In my middle age and sensible girth, I remember starving. I didn't know why. I practiced being a ghost. I was a girl. I thought this was how one became a woman. I lived in a village in Italy. It was picturesque. I was not picturesque. That was the project. I gnawed stale bread, roamed vineyards and olive groves, drew portraits of artichoke plants under twisted trees, recited Petrarch, and grew so thin I was a dazzling knife blade in my new white pants. The old grandmother quietly cursed in a corner. Her family ignored her. They ignored me. I recited more Petrarch and bought a broad-brimmed crimson straw hat. What to do with this girl? She learned to survive long spells of dryness. She embraced strangers, and they stayed strange. She painted still lives, and they stayed still. She dreamed she attended a soiree at a Soho loft where the main dish on a platter garnished with parsley was a woman's naked torso, roasted, belly down, crisply hot. She looked for the small flame guttering in a sacred jar. Giving birth was one way. Holding a dying man's hand was another. 
he buried small animals with appropriate rights in the backyard. And here are the generations. Water and fire begat turpentine, which joined earth and brought forth color from mineral loins and boiled down vegetable soul. So steeped and soaked this land where I live now, so rushing in rain, roof tiles bristle in moss, close woven or feathery, sprigging with spores. The cemetery teems, lichen, honeysuckle, roses, little mildewed photographs under glass. Enemies make peace. Centuries fall through limestone cracks. And Edith came up the street this morning to bring me Le Monde and La Revue des Deux Mondes and a packet of fresh goat cheese before setting out in rain on her drive to the Dordogne. And I'd like to turn now to a different sort of work, my vitamin pill Odyssey, for which I need to stand back here and, and show you the slides. The painter Jim McGarrell um, painted these monotypes, which are in a, a blue ink uh, from the olive trees in Italy where he was living, inspired from the Odyssey. And um, then he asked me to write an accompanying text. And these are just tiny little fragments of the Odyssey with which I'll conclude. I was inspired. I, the Odyssey is a poem I adore. I have read parts of it in Greek over the years. I've reread it and reread it in English. And, and yet, I re experienced the poem by seeing it through McGarrell's eyes. Ithaca. Recognition that we live inside and outside. Light corrodes both. Living bodies take shape from corrosion. Olive trees tremble in sunstroke and shift into phantoms. We are all pouring through our own forms, and the house shudders. Who is safe? Nestor's heifer. The sacrifice sends a message with gilded horns tiptoeing among the gods. Blood jets from the heifer's sliced jugular from time into eternity as old age steps back, wiping gore from his axe blade. He has sent a gleam into darkness. The house door blazes. Olive trees lean in toward the altar. They have messages to send something indecipherable whispered as leaf wets leaf blade and the bark cracks. The sea groans in its sleep. I'm going to jump. Uh, you'll get a sense to um, wine of Maron. Distilled sunlight drugged with red earth scent, cicada song, lavender, thyme, Flecks of mica, the cries of dying men. They poured it from slaughter into 12 amphorae. There is a techne for distilling blood and prayer. That wine has the texture of honey. It catches the light. Apollo approves. It will keep you from harm. Kirky's swine. And that is our nature as well. Did you think we were all light, air, fire, and mind? Light can precipitate into flesh. We are driven into solids, solidly driven. We forget our names. This too is holy. The olive tree suffers a paroxysm, and sky thickens to lard. If you claim not to know this, you're lying. Come here. For those, I assume every student at Vanderbilt knows that Kirky in the Odyssey turns men into swine. <laughs> um, this uh, oxen of Helios, the oxen of the sun, 
who are not supposed to be slaughtered and eaten by Odysseus's men. And of course, they were. Yes, we know about prohibited meat, but we don't really know until it writhes and bellows and leaps off the spit. Mad cows, these cattle strike a disease in the brain deeper than sunstroke. The sun had seemed benign. Now flame shoots along the nerves, spasms into sparklers, and hunger turns to horror. We thought we had eaten fire. Our leader slept. Divination by Helen. That is, of course, Helen of Troy, for whom the whole shebang was fought. She knows more than she should. After all those years, she stands straight, a gash of sunlight, yet remains cold, though the beam she directs into the hearts of others reveals more pleats and hollows than anatomists could name. Her own heart is practiced, tired of its practices, and unstoppable. The eagle lumbers past with the plundered goose. She knows more than she wants. She sees more than she wants to see of tawdry, mortal, repetitious rapacity and longing for anesthesia, which she supplies in small doses at cost. And here's Telemachus, the son of Odysseus. When the boy man falls into the hands of women, his body turns to steam. They massage his cloud muscles with gold-flecked oil. Under a stream of hot water, he will take the shape they want, doll body. He will slip through their fingers. Mist between trees billows into female thighs, pelvises, chests, a company of promise always just beyond his grasp. Eurycleia, she's of course the nurse who recognizes Odysseus when he's still in disguise as a beggar. Uh, she recognizes him from the famous scar on his thigh as she bathes him. Take a swig. <clears throat> Almost finished. Eurycleia, who had nursed him, dandled, swaddled, soothed him as a baby, who had sent him off in a clean tunic to hunt the boar, who had tended fires and scrubbed pavements and counted sacks of grain these fourscore years, now startles back on her heels, his hand at her throat, a man's grip, a known hand. We can call it another name for tenderness, as the boar's tusk ripping the boy's thigh can be counted a blessing, a kind of caress. A ring of oily scum forms at the basin's rim. In hearthlight, their shadows leap. The suitors. Arrow in the throat, pitched wine, mere meat smear in hot grease, to gag on an oath, to gulp blood, to have seen no script in bird flight, one rolls under the table, gutted, where once he tumbled the plump-armed maid and poured himself out against her belly. For flesh seeks flesh, even in the final banquet, and dark meets light as if it were a dance. A kind of music floats from the shuttered hall. And this is one of the most shocking scenes in the, Odi uh, in the Odyssey. After Odysseus has killed the suitors, he then proceeds to hang the housemaids who had slept with the suitors. Spasm in the pelvis, involuntarily jerking legs. They have known this dance before. It wasn't called justice then. Pleasure takes us by storm. One has to have a knack for abandoning oneself. That, too, is an art. The human body would break most olive boughs. There is such weight in us. 
Laertes' supper, here's where father, grandfather, father, son all come together and restore the household and the kingdom. You want the pattern to declare itself. You want the puzzle pieces to snap into place. Who among us does not want to be known? They are to be recognized in deeds of blood, same set of jaw, squared shoulders, reddening eye, inheritance, the mother long since expelled. They have made this scene with their own hands. They almost believe they have made themselves. And here's the end, you're about to be released. Tell me what it looks like when the olive groves have burned and mist rolls in at dawn over charred earth and sifts between skeletal branches. It may take this scorching to make peace on earth. The last pyres have petered out. If bones stick from ash, they are barely distinguishable from roots. In the emptied groves, among twisted, ghostly forms, we dreamed justice was done. Thank you. You don't have to ask a question. I myself find it awkward to ask questions after a reading, but if anyone would like to, I would be happy to chat. Yes. I do lots and lots of rewriting. I'm very slow. It has been pointed out to me that sometimes there's a gap of nine years between my books of poetry. Um, Many of my colleagues write more quickly than that. Uh, that's partly because I do other things like translating and writing criticism, but it's also partly because I throw out so much and I sometimes work on a single poem over months or even years. I call it my compost heap. Um, uh, and not this, I'm a, a fetishist of notebooks, you may be beginning to surmise. I not only have all little notebooks in my satchel, but my bigger notes. So this is the notebook, the fetish notebook for poems that I consider finished, but there's another notebook which is my compost heap, which is much fatter, full of the muck of poems that are composing and decomposing, and I sometimes dig into the compost heap and see how they're doing. Um. <laughs> Do I see? Yes. That's a great question. Um, I, my own answer is that I don't think a poet should care too much about an audience because you can become a whore. It's really important not to care too much about the audience. Um, but it's also important to care. So it's a, to, for me, it's a delicate balance. Um, and part of my audience, and I, I know many, many poets who say the same thing, is the audience of the dead, the, the dead poets from whom we come and to whom we send our voice, hoping that by some bizarre sonar it, it might come back to us. Um, that's, an, that's a very important audience. If you're only writing for your friends or your, enemy, your immediate enemies <laughs> or, or, or with the last New Yorker poem in mind, I think you're likely to be writing trash. Um, so uh, it's, it's a wonderful question. But on the, on the other hand, I, um, I, being the sort of writer who, who is very inspired from older literary traditions in several languages, I have had to work hard not to be what I would call an academic poet. I don't want my poems to, to have to be read by people with PhDs. Um, and I don't want them to hang out there uh, their academic credentials in, in the poem. So I want them to work on their own dramatic, emotional, imagistic 
force. And if someone happens to have read Ruskin or you know, know something about Venetian history, then okay, that's a, that's a bonus. I don't know if that's a, <laughs> a tolerable answer. <laughs> Yes. When you were about to read the poem that you wrote after your time in New Orleans, you said that you wanted a poem to be more than journalism. Yes. Can you say any more words about that distinction and why that matters to you? Yeah, it matters intensely because uh, on the one hand, I, uh, I care about truthfulness. I, I very much, and I didn't, I didn't mention Ruskin by accident. Ruskin is a great hero for me, and he was also a great draftsman. And this training of looking at the world outside the self and trying to get it right, trying to be accurate, the way Ruskin spent years up on scaffolding, crawling over the churches of Venice, measuring the joists, joists and the joints, and trying to figure out how the Gothic churches of Venice were put together, which no one had done before he did this, it is intensely moving to me, when, the way he writes about this in The Stones of Venice. He wanted to get it right and accurate. And I have that drive in, in my poems, to the extent that I remember a poem I didn't read today involving trees in Boston. Um, I was puzzled about what these trees were, and I went out with my tree book, and I studied them, and I still they were on the, along the Esplanade along the Charles River, and I still wasn't quite sure. And I called the city of Boston. I said, does anybody? in the city of Boston government specialize in trees? And lo and behold, they said, yes, we have a city arborist. So I had <laughs> a fantastic conversation for an hour with the city arborist, and we determined that this was a, <laughs> a crack willow tree, and the other one was a basswood. Um, <laughs> so that is my, the cons my fundamental concern to get things accurate is at the base. But then the imagination needs to work on this data and needs to transform it into some kind of symbolic shape, which for me is partly <coughs> partly um, about arrangement of images and partly about engineering emotional drama and partly it's rhythmical, it's acoustic. Um, and if there isn't that transformation of the data, uh, I don't think it's lifted off and b become a poem. And I also think there are a lot of texts around, some of them written by me, no doubt, that look like poems. If you look at them on the page, they have a very jagged uh, right-hand margin, but they haven't been transformed. That fundamental alchemy of the imagination hasn't happened. Yes? It, it was earlier on. Um, I had to be willfully blind to it. And my early years, I was, by which I mean from early childhood through my early 20s, I, my, my state in mission was to try to be a painter. And I drew and I painted and went to art schools. And I was always writing, too, but somewhat secretively. Um, and that was partly a, it wasn't a conscious cover, but it really it gave me a good camouflage. Um, because it would have been impossible to, um, it wasn't a matter of competition, it was a matter of the static coming from the outside. Oh, you're so-and-so's daughter, well then you just got it all, you know, you're cheating. Um, so I, if I listened to that static, I never would have written anything. So I had to be willfully deaf and blind for a few years and incredibly stubborn. Uh, and now, what the hell? <laughs> you know, I'm almost an old lady. I can do what I like. <laughs> it's great to get old. I am so happy to be in my mid-50s. <laughs> I might not say that when I'm 85, but who knows? I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> yes? Yeah, um, that's a, I love that question because both are passions for me, um, uh, and the tension I would say is perhaps more practical. That is, time spent writing essays and uh, is not time spent 
writing poems, and it's a different part of the brain. Um, on the other hand, uh, um, the notion of imaginative inheritance is very powerful for me, and it's not biological inheritance. It is, for me, from Sappho, Catullus, and Hardy, uh, that um, I want to deserve to read those poems, to, to inhabit them, um, and to have them help shape me. And that takes a lot of work, uh, and part of that work for me turns into criticism. My study of those works, uh, as my translation, my work in translation too, uh, turns into a writing out of my, sorting out of my thoughts about it, which turns into criticism. And that ultimately, I think, gives me ideas for my own ambitions as a, as a poet. Um, one of the documents that moves me most is Thomas Hardy's notebooks, where he is trying to work out the Greek, the, Thomas Hardy, of course, being born into the rural poor in England, uh, so desperate to get an education, getting it only in the little village school, and then from um, the clergymen who could teach him something, lend him books. His, his notebook where he wrote out the sapphic stanza in the Greek, and he, wrote, he has the metrical s system of the longs and shorts, and he's trying to fit it to English a verse and understand how English accentual syllabic meter could accommodate the Greek. This is, this to me is just, it, it's a primal scene of inheritance. It's the primal scene of the recombinant DNA of literature. Um, and he worked so hard to get it. That's what I think we sometimes forget if we, um, as students and as teachers, the real thing, however you come to it, whether you're the daughter of a poet or an engineer or, or, or what, it doesn't really, it's the, the biology finally doesn't matter. It's the hard work, the hard work of earning that inheritance. Um, I once heard that the Chinese, my colleague at Boston University, one of my colleagues is the Chinese fiction writer, Ha Jin, who, whom I enormously admire. And I once heard him give a talk um, to the graduate students in the creative writing program there about his concept of having a master. It was such a wonderfully un-American talk. It was so Chinese. It was a sense of Chekhov was his master, and it was all about devotion to the, <laughs> to the master. And I saw these young Americans going, what? Master? Me? A master? No way. <laughs> Yes.